good morning. Um, for those who are just coming in, can you please move forward? We want to have a closed collaboration and uh, in practice. If you could please move forward, we'll appreciate that. Can you come to the first, second rows, please, as you move, come in? Thank you. Yep. Sorry. Even assign the front row. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sure you all enjoyed the good weather of Geneva. Um, this morning, uh, we sorry we started a bit late, um, but we'll try and make up for the time. Um, this morning, I have a very interesting um, set of speakers and audience um, at this very special Commonwealth uh, Forum. Um, I've just put the agenda on the screen. Um, to welcome you, which is what I'm doing now, followed by um, the approach uh, which we have adopted within the Commonwealth on developing na uh, national cybersecurity strategies. Um, Gavin Williams, um, who is uh, from the UK National Cybersecurity Centre, 
working with the International Relations Team, who will also be telling us about the experience in the UK um, and giving us best practices on cybersecurity. Uh, followed by my very good friend here, Tracy Hackshaw, who um, is an ICT and digital economy strategist. He works, he has held several portfolios, including director of um, Tudidan and Tobago Multi Stakeholder Advisory Group. And then I'll have Robert Scollett, who um, is the head of capacity building, prosperity um, at the UK FCO, that's the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the UK. And then we have uh, an open discussion um, to hear some very, imp get some input from you, the audience. So without much ado, let me welcome you formally to this um, morning session. And Anita, uh, on my right, we have at the far right, we have Anita uh, Sohan. She is the coordinator for global security um, agenda at the CTO. Um, and next to him is a UN official who is monitoring all the data. And uh, we might also have um, one or two people join us online. Uh, so he's looking after all that. So, Anita, can you please show my slides? I hope you can all see. No? Some, something's wrong. Is that it? Okay. Um, now, many of you are quite familiar with uh, the Commonwealth. Um, we are a very special breed. Uh, we cut across all the continents, main continents of the globe, um, from Americas, Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. Um, we do have uh, 52 countries who are members of the Commonwealth, and the heads of states of all these countries meet every two years. Uh, the next meeting being in London in April uh, next year, where one of the agenda items will be on cybersecurity. And uh, we want to appeal to you to help us uh, to drive that objective by informing your colleagues back home at the highest level to ensure that our heads of state are well prepared for this meeting. Um, you're also very familiar with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, even though cybersecurity is not um, addressed per se as one of the goals, uh, you will realize that for each of those goals, there is uh, some reference uh, to how cybersecurity can affect all of these issues here, whether it's food, whether it's gender equality, uh, whether it's you know, reducing inequalities, or, and, and so on. That's, these are why we have just put all these goals here. Uh, cybersecurity runs across all these themes. Um, we cannot overemphasize the uh, importance of cybersecurity strategies. Um, safety, security, and resilience are critical for cyberspace in all our countries. Um, national cybersecurity strategies uh, provide a framework for countries to uh, have an all-encompassing approach to protect cyberspace infrastructure. And every country, every single country is currently busy either ensuring the implementation of the strategies which they have implemented or fine-tuning them or actually trying to um, uh, build and um, establish a very resilient and secure uh, cyberspace. Uh, we at the CTO, we're quite active in assisting to facilitate uh, countries who either want to um, prepare the framework and we ensure that they do it themselves. Um, all we do is basically to provide support to facilitate the process. Um, and once countries adopt the strategies, they can leverage on the, all the opportunities which um, ICT brings for socioeconomic development. Um, recently, a minister said to me, I have a big broadband project, but I'm quite worried that as, as I expand my broadband network, I'm worried about the cybersecurity aspect. So it's um, something which cuts across all the work that our ministers you know, have to undertake. Um, we adopted what we call a Commonwealth approach to developing national cyber security strategies. Um, we did have a, a model which our ministers adopted in 2014. Uh, the Commonwealth ICT ministers also meet every two years. So in 2014, they adopted model, and based on that model, there are certain principles which 
are encompassed in that model. And they also draw from the Commonwealth Charter. Um, some of the principles um, with regards to cyberspace, one, uh, that they all commit to a safe and effective global cyberspace. Two, that all the actions taken in cyberspace are to support broader economic and social development. Thirdly, to act individually and collectively. As you know, some of these uh, cyber attacks are not just national, they cut across borders. And fourthly, that each country exercise their rights and responsibilities within this uh, sub cyberspace. Next one. Um, when we assist countries to facilitate development of their strategies, the number of uh, processes that we go through, um, we do gap analysis in terms of uh, preparing uh, CMM, cybersecurity maturity, maturity assessments, that helps to understand where the country is, what are the issues, uh, what are the gaps, where are the <coughs> gaps, what do we do to address those gaps. Uh, we look at the global context because we all operate uh, within a global village, if you like. We look at the strategic goals for each country, uh, either from the constitution or from the national planning. Uh, we see how it, it down um, tilts into the cybersecurity strategies. We look at the risks, national risks, global, and we set up vision, priorities, objectives, and all of this are encompassed in every country that we have been active. And one more important thing is that we ensure that government involves stakeholders. Um, it has been a very interesting, sometimes frustrating exercise to convince governments that stakeholder participation is essential. Uh, but I'm happy to report that most of the governments we are dealing with are now beginning to, be, to feel comfortable that without a stakeholder particip participation, they will not get the buy-in that they themselves want. Uh, so it's a process which we continue to adopt. Um, I will not run through this. We have done a lot of work um, thanks to financial support from the UK government through the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, in about 12 countries, either addressing cyber uh, strategies or looking at um, cyber crime or standards. Um, most of our countries, um, if you look at the economy, uh, it's virtually dominated by the SMEs, the small and medium enterprises. Whichever way you, def you, you actually define it, because countries define SMEs differently. But all in all, we find out that they contribute a majority of the GDP. And it's quite important to really support those um, entities. And what we've done is to take a cue from a very successful exper ex experience in the UK, where the UK government has addressed the issue of how do you encourage these small businesses to meet basic standards. Yes, the ISO 20, 27000 has been adopted globally, but this may be sometimes cumbersome, too expensive for these small businesses. So there was a process in the UK where um, private sector government collaboration led to creating a, a consortium uh, that could actually you know, um, endorse that certain businesses, small businesses, satisfy those five basic controls which have been identified. So we tried to see how we can use that experience and um, bring that experience to our countries. And gradually, countries are beginning to uh, examine that, and they're finding it quite interesting. Next slide. Um, these are the countries that we have worked on, Rwanda, um, Swaziland, Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, Botswana, Uganda, Cameroon. The others also that we've uh, also working on, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, um, and all in the process to ensure that every country has a safe and secure service space. Yeah. Well, basically that's it. Um, we can interact further, um, either during discussions or during coffee breaks. Um, without ado, I would, if you can reserve your questions till late so that we can take the presentations and then move on to an uh, open discussion. Uh, so with that, I'll move to uh, Gavin Williams who will talk about best practices on cybersecurity. Thank you. Gary. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would very much like to welcome Shola's very wise words on the importance of national cybersecurity strategies, and, and, and we strongly encourage all nations to have such things. Um, I work for the National Cybersecurity Center, and one of our roles is to develop and publish cybersecurity guidance. Um, our documents, they're primarily aimed at government departments and industry, both large and small. Um, some years ago, our publications were, were very different, 
and were often mandatory for government. Much of our output was actually classified information or was withheld from open publication. Uh, things have changed hugely in that respect, and these days we publish uh, pretty much all our guidance uh, on our website, where it's available for anybody. We try to make it very readable. Some years ago, our documents were absolutely marvellous technical manuals, and the only people who read them were those who absolutely had to. These days, we actually want to produce documents that people will want to read. Um, one of our clear intents is to enable industry to operate in a secure, stable, and free internet. And we believe that this encourages commercial prosperity and encourages investment. Much of our guidance has been developed in consultation uh, with um, other parts of government and with industry. Uh, while I'm talking about partnership, we also engage very heavily with academia. And we regard cybersecurity as very much a team sport. The National Cyber Security Centre has a unique role, but we also want to leverage expertise from all sectors, and we encourage all other nations to do the same. We have radically reviewed some of our thinking. In some cases, the, the guidance that we publish is quite different to the guidance that we published some years ago. Underlying all this is the principle of risk management. We want all our, our, our customers to assess the risks relevant to their business and to make informed decisions suited to their own needs. We do not do tick box guidance. As an, as an illustration of the, the changes to our thinking, uh, we've rather changed our guidance on passwords. The, the classical guidance on passwords was that they should be long and they should be from a rich character set and they should be changed regularly. We were finding that this was unmanageable. Uh, we call it password overload, and we've now changed our guidance. Um, a lot of us have quite a number of passwords for various systems and services. So these days, we are recommending the use of password managers or password vaults or whatever terminology you choose to, to, to use to, to, to hold your passwords. Uh, the ones used in, in browsers are, are quite often uh, fine, they're, they're perfectly okay, but our strong recommendation is that if you're using a browser for this, or indeed for most purposes, please use the very latest version of the browser. Um, a standalone password manager might be a better option, but th there will be some master um, access uh, mechanism for that. You may have a choice of a password or a passphrase. We would recommend using um, a passphrase, in that that can be longer and is easily memorable, and you're more likely to remember it. Um, where you do need a password these days, we suggest a combination of three short unrelated words. Putting three unrelated things together actually makes them quite difficult to guess. If there is an important account, we recommend that it is secured with two-factor authentication. We do not recommend forcing passwords to expire. They should be changed where there is a compromise. And just looking forward a little bit, we are starting to wonder if passwords have had their day and we should be looking for, for other authentication methods. I've just dug a little way into um, our guidance on passwords. My request is that you don't take my words out of context. Please read our guidance. We explain the risks and the pitfalls. And again, please make your own decision as to what password policy uh, you, you support. The guidance that, that, that I'm talking about here is really aimed at um, unclassified or lowly classified government networks or commercial systems, and that is nearly all systems. If, however, you are securing your most sensitive national systems, then the risks change and the mitigations may be rather conservative. Again, make a wise choice, please. Um, our guidance that is available covers um, quite a range of subjects. I'm certainly not going to list it all. Our website um, uh, does have the further details, but just as an illustration of the range and hopefully the currency um, of um, our, our guidance, uh, some recent ones uh, include uh, a document on managing the risk of cloud-enabled technologies, and behind that we've also published um, 14 principles of cloud security. Uh, we've published guidance on uh, using TLS, which is uh, Transport Flare Security, uh, which is a, a protocol for securing access to uh, websites and mail servers, and I'll come back to that in a moment. We've published a set of documents on risk management, and before anybody groans, I think they're reasonably readable um, documents on, on, on risk management. And we've also recently published um, a small business guide. So we do try to cover quite a range of subjects, but there is a whole lot more on our website. Two of our most important publications are 
10 Steps to Cybersecurity, which gives an organization uh, essential advice. And keeping with the word essential, we also have uh, a scheme called Cyber Essentials. And this is a package of guidance and organizational assessment measures that's been widely adopted in the UK. The guidance, is, well, all the documentation is freely available. The guidance is there and may be useful to many organizations. Uh, the certification end of uh, Cyber Essentials is mostly focused on the UK, but there may be things in there that you want to use, and organizations can do self-assessment. We are encouraging the take-up of Cyber Essentials as a way of helping to mitigate the risks of the supply chain. Supply chain is a really difficult issue in cybersecurity. The idea is that companies will um, become certified under the Cyber Essentials Scheme, and that helps to give assurance as to um, their fitness to be part of the supply chain for um, um, uh, other customers or anybody buying products and services. So Cyber Essentials, very widely available in the UK, and the, the details are, are fully available. Uh, we work very closely with industry. The flow of information is very much in both directions. Uh, to increase capacity, because certainly my organization does not have anything like the capacity to uh, pr provide the services that, that, that our customers want. Uh, we have licensed a whole set of industry partners to provide, to provide essential cybersecurity services, such as pen testing, incident recovery, training, consultancy. So there is a badge which we are behind, uh, but it is industry that will provide the service. We recommend this as a way forward. It is to the advantage of industry and those who need help. We see this as a win-win. It helps both sides. One of our other initiatives at the moment is called Active Cyber Defense. Now, before that scares anybody, that is not about hacking back. It is trying to improve some of the underlying weaknesses that cause us problems. It is trying to improve the environment in which our customers are working. There are a number of parts to our active cyber defense. Uh, one of them is looking at hardening some of the protocols such as SS7, which is a telephony uh, signaling system uh, to take out some of the issues to do with um, unnecessary rerouting. And also BGP, border gateway protocol, uh, which is to do with, with routers and where there are a number of uh, issues that uh, um, keep affecting us. We are transmitting, we, we're not transmitting, we are transitioning uh, most government email systems to use a protocol protocol called DMARC, and this is a tool which will assist in reducing email spoofing, which is something of an issue. So we, we intend that all government email systems will transition to using this DMARC system as an additional mitigation to anything else they're doing. Also, we have engaged uh, Nominet, which is a company which is not only the UK Internet Registry, but it provides various other cybersecurity services, to establish a DNS service for the UK Public Service, and this is to allow us to um, uh, control or limit uh, access to sites that we know to be harmful. We're also developing a web check service so that public sector websites can easily be checked for um, vulnerabilities. Uh, that's at an early stage, but we're getting some quite good feedback. One of the reasons that we're doing these uh, active cyber defense initiatives is to try to show that if we can make them work, then others may be able to use them as well. So these, these are, are things which may be very widely applicable to the rest of the community. So, so please consider um, uh, looking at these. Uh, I mentioned DMARC um, and um, our guidance on the use of TLS, transmission layer security. That includes a whole set of um, parameters for um, enabling and suitably configuring the DMARC service within TLS to secure um, um, email server um, access. Some of these things are quite complicated and advanced and technical. Actually, at the heart of our guidance are some very, very simple messages. Uh, we wish we didn't have to keep doing this, but we have to repeat some of the very obvious stuff every year because lessons, I'm afraid, do not get learned, and we keep coming back to some simple messages. Those include, please patch your systems. A number of the major events that we've seen in, in uh, cyberspace have been because patching had gone wrong. Please secure all your accounts with passwords. It sounds obvious. I'm afraid we've come across a number of incidents where <coughs> accounts were not secured. And please have a backup regime. If you get hit by ransomware, your best defense is to have had a backup regime in place so you can go back to a known stable state. Um, I think I've used up my time. Um, we have a lot of guidance on our website. Uh, you're very welcome to look at that, and I'm w welcome to take any questions later in the session. Thank you.
Um, thank you very much, Gavin. I'm sure you've um, excited us with uh, the guidelines from the UK National Service Centre, uh, particularly on your password uh, analysis mm. and things that are yet to come. I think that will stimulate everyone here to go and check your guidelines. Um, I will now move to um, Tracy Hackshaw, who will be uh, speaking to us about challenges faced by SEEDs and LDCs. Tracy. Thank you, um, Shola. Thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, so I'm speaking here on the uh, small and developing states and um, least developed countries issues. And uh, I'm not going to be technical today. I'm just going to be um, talk about the issues related to the um, social and economic side of it. Um, basically, in these territories and these uh, countries, um, what we are seeing happening is a series of, of issues facing um, our, our states that relate to dislocation. So over the last maybe 10 to 20 years, we've had ex extreme cases of social and economic dislocation. And through this, um, we find a breeding ground for um, criminal tendencies. Um, added to that, the importation, importation of technological sophistication. So both in terms of actual in the real world, you know, weapons and so on, but also in, in the cyber world. So we're seeing a lot of importation of um, anything from as, as, as uh, skimming devices and, and um, phishing type tools, um, Wi-Fi, hacking happening at airports and at um, other locations, as well as um, other more um, drastic uh, importation from countries in, um, in the case of um, the Caribbean, Latin America, um, and in other parts of the, uh, from the Middle East and so on. So what we are seeing here are potential fertile areas for um, the emergence of cyber terrorism happening within these countries. And as you may have read or heard about, even possible exportation of these um, of citizens and, and resources within these territories to other countries to, to conduct that business because of the lack of, of opportunities that are happening within our, our territories. And added to that, um, when you look at the internal to the, the SIDS and um, least developed countries, we have a series of um, emerging submerged and, and visible ethnic conflicts that are rising to the surface and creating these uh, situations where cybercrime and, and cyberterrorism uh, are seen as, as outlets for, for bringing that, um, those conflicts to the surface and, and making those things real. Um, we also have the, what, we, what I call the subjectivity of security, and where we see what, what security and its um, corollary in the cyber world, you know, cyber security, um, being used as a means to protect and control. So what we have is a, an opportunity for uh, potential cyber criminals to use the, th those avenues that are emerging to, to win favor within their communities um, to become, so we have the emergence of gangs, um, and within the gang leader uh, scenario, you have cyber um, aspects of it. So if you're able to, to be a, a better hacker, or you're able to prove that you can hack, you're, you, you rise up in the community, and you're given a certain level of um, status, and especially within countries like ourselves, where those things are not um, very prevalent you are given a particular type of status within that community and therefore you are looked up to. And that's an interesting scenario that is happening as well in these countries. And of course, to fight cybersecurity and cyber, well, to fight cybercrime and to encourage cybersecurity, the extreme technological barriers within these territories. So very limited resources, both technical, financial, financial and human. And of course, our geographical and geopolitical disadvantages uh, are, are very, um, uh, critical to that emergence of of, uh, of a particular class of, of individual who are able to, to be the system, as you're saying. Um, as, as you would have seen in many of these countries, skimming, the simple act of skimming is extraordinarily prevalent and a huge market for credit cards exists within these countries. So you find that um, in the skimming world, for those who know what skimming is, you find the countries that are, um, let's say, in, I don't want to call country names, but are in uh, other parts of the world who are purchasers of credit card numbers and, and that sort of information, 
higher out um, countries like small developing states and less developed countries to do that work both in country as well as remotely. So that's another emerging issue that's happening uh, that we need to deal with. And because the, the te technological barriers exist <coughs> within the protective agencies, it's very difficult to actually solve those criminal elements as quickly as you deal with one issue and then one emerges. So that's a very important issue to treat with. Um, I don't want to spend too much time um, because I know time is running short, but in the cases of, um, in my country, Trinidad and Tobago, I would just give an example where we have crime levels escalating at unprecedented rates, which as I mentioned before, leads to this um, emergence of a cyber criminal uh, faction. And you have social networks, literally social networks, meaning not just social networks online, but social networks offline, um, developing themselves as, as what I call safe harbors. So anything from a Facebook group, to a WhatsApp group, to a real group, um, developing as a safe harbor, um, developing themselves as carriers of criminal activity from one um, gang to another, and predatory boot camps. So again, having that um, situation emerge very quickly within the region. So I'll stop there just giving those, those issues um, for discussion. I'm willing to, um, to answer any questions thereafter. Shoda. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy. Uh, quite interesting to hear from you on perspectives on how you're fighting cyber crimes, uh, given your limited resources, and to see also how you've recognized the hackers and even them having some kind of competition. Uh, that's a very interesting experience, uh, which has been well managed. Um, let's now move to um, a colleague and friend, Robert Collett, uh, to talk to us about Chogum and how cybersecurity will be uh, discussed at the next Heads of States meeting in London in April. Robert. Yes, thank you. Thank um, you. Speak so loudly, I'm not used to this. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, if I could start with a little bit about the Sustainable Development Goals piece and then move on. Um, as somebody who, who works on capacity building day in, day out, which essentially means um, different countries helping other governments to improve their cybersecurity capability or working with companies and civil society to support international projects which help improve cybersecurity capacity building. Um, we, we ask ourselves quite a lot, um, what is it that we're achieving? Um, we started out doing these projects because we wanted to protect the UK and we knew that the UK um, its cybersecurity was intrinsically linked to the security of all of our partners around the world. It is not a problem that you can solve by just building your walls higher. You need to go out to the source of the problem and you need to build up international community defenses and solutions. So we, sp we started by looking at this about how we can make ourselves safe. But then we've gone on a journey which has made us realize that actually, helping improve cybersecurity around the world is contributing to the sustainable development goals. Um, it can do this by one, helping implement the do no harm principle in ICT for development projects, but it can also do it through maximizing good. Um, those programs which think about cybersecurity from the very beginning tend to have better outcomes um, and there's lots of advantages you can get by working with um, your commercial sector partners um, who are aware of cybersecurity and through your civil society partners who are aware of cybersecurity and thinking about security from the start of programs. Um, so we are, we're fully committed to this approach and we think that it works. Um, if I had a request to the people in the room, uh, it would be the first, I'm gonna come back to a second one. The first would be, we know it works, but being able to measure the impact is very challenging. We've got a real data problem here um, about being able to draw the connections between capacity building and harm reduction and then delivering uh, specific SDG SDGs. Um, there's a good narrative story, but being able to put that into numbers is quite challenging and that needs to be solved through a collaboration between companies, universities, civil society and government. So that would be the first thing. Um, the second, uh, which I'll come on to, is, well, we know it works, how do we do more of it? Um, and that's where we come on to two things. 
at the global level, um, India has just hosted the Global Conference on Cyberspace, and at that, something called the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, which is a group of governments, countries, civil society, universities who want to do more in this area, launched a global agenda for cyber capacity building, which essentially says, we all want to do more of this. Let's agree to focus on a few areas. Let's adopt good principles from the development community and the security community. And let's coordinate and work together to do this. Um, and I was really pleased that that could be launched in Delhi. Uh, it's up on the GFC website. And it's something that a lot of people around the world are going to be getting involved in and putting effort behind. So that's at the global level. And now we come to what can the Commonwealth do? Um, well, I think the Commonwealth is going to be one of those uh, intergovernmental organizations and people-to-people -people organizations which respond to that global agenda, respond to the potential to use cybersecurity for the SDGDs, and respond to that security challenge we face. Um, we are part of conversations every day within the Commonwealth about how we deal with those problems, and there's a huge number of projects going on already. And the question is, how do we take it to the next level? And that's where the UK, as hosts of the April 2018 Heads of Government meeting, um, are delighted that the CTO, uh, its council, called on Heads of Government to address cybersecurity for the first time as a, a main issue on the agenda. Um, and that was discussed in Delhi uh, in a multi-stakeholder group around the Commonwealth. And they said, yeah, we like that idea. Thank you, CTO Council, for recommending it. Let's go forward to the next stage. And then that led to this meeting here um, and a number of other meetings going on around the world on these subjects. And um, what we really want to do is say, have we got the right list of project ideas coming out of these meetings. Um, does what's up on the screen make sense to you? Is it something that your company or your civil society group or your government or your university could contribute to? Um, and we also want to make sure that we've got the political uh, strand of this right as well, the political uh, commitments and ambitions. And so uh, a document has been drawn up after that multi-stakeholder process of consultation um, which has a list of ideas which are now in circulation um, and the CTO can circulate that to anyone in attendance here. Um, and we'll be taking that forward through the good offices of the Commonwealth Secretariat and with the help of the CTO to that heads of government meeting in April. Um, so from my side, I've spoken a lot. I think really what I wanted this uh, meeting to be is uh, a two-way discussion or actually a chance for me to listen and to hear from the floor what do people want to see heads of government do in April to do more about cybersecurity? Do these ideas look like good ideas and what could you contribute and what would you ask from the Commonwealth heads of government uh, if you're able to pass on those messages, which you can through, through this panel and the CTA. So thank you very much for the chance to speak. Good, thanks, that's great. Um, I think that message is very clear. We need inputs. Um, we already have someone online who wants to ask a question. Please be very, very brief, straight to the point. Yeah, over to you. Thank you, Chair. We have a question from uh, Mr. Dennis Doe Fonchen from Cameroon. A very good question. He is asking, what is the CTO doing to facilitate the training of cybersecurity experts in member countries, especially in developing countries, where this is a serious problem? Thank you. Okay, we'll take quite a few questions and address them. Yes, please introduce yourself. Uh, the organization you're affiliated with. I'm Deepak. I work with Semantic in India. My question is, uh, uh, in this particular list, uh, I don't see anything about information exchange, which is basically about uh, exchange of information between private sector and public sector. So what type of partnerships and programs should be? Because typically, the governments do seek information from private sector, which is good. Uh, but at the same time, they should also uh, see this whole thing as a two-way process that the government should also share uh, back uh, with the industry something. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please note that the intent of this exercise is to get input for heads of governments. This is not a normal seminar where you ask questions and, you know, so let's focus on what are the issues we want to bring before our heads of state. Yes, please, madam. 
Hi, uh, my, na my name is Alex. I'm from Privacy International, a charity based in the UK, but works internationally. Uh, my question for governments is to see how the work they're doing on cybersecurity um, you know, needs to be harmonized or how it actually contradicts some of the broader work that we're seeing where they're actually making systems and services more vulnerable uh, by expanding their surveillance capabilities when it comes to government hacking, uh, but also undermining uh, encryption. So we need to see some consistency in government policies on that with one aspect working on cybersecurity and the other actually undermining it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Belisario Contreras from the OIS, and I want to congratulate you for the initiative and actually want to, well, make sure that everyone knows that the OIS and the CTO have a strategic partnership on, on cybersecurity. Uh, and actually, we, we work very well on Caribbean Commonwealth countries, which are, I think, around 12 or 14 countries that are members of the Commonwealth. Uh, one thing that I think would be very appropriate to, to share with, uh, with our member states, uh, at least the Caribbean side, is the, the need to, to have a proper follow-up of the initiatives. Uh, at least in the Caribbean, uh, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago are the only uh, member states that have a, a cybersecurity strategy. Uh, right now, Trinidad and Tobago is the only Caribbean country that have a, a national cert. Uh, many Caribbean countries, we have already received many requests uh, to be all, to have them with law enforcement units. Uh, but unfortunately, um, due to um, several, due to several issues, uh, natural disasters, education, uh, it's very difficult to prioritize sometimes cybersecurity, number one. Second, uh, sometimes Ministry of Securities, Ministries of Telecommunications, or Ministries uh, even of Education, uh, get involved and it's very difficult to understand who is the the main uh, leader or the, the main role. Of course, this is something that both of both organizations when we go in country try to, to organize. But it's very difficult and if the heads of governments can give more clarity on this, it will be very useful for all, for all the countries. And third, uh, and it's very important that once those structures are defined and budgets are identi identified, there is a, a proper follow-up uh, and there is actually uh, the proper uh, allocation of both human and financial resources because there are great support from, from governments like the UK and the European Union and others, but without the proper uh, allocation of human and financial resources, uh, there will be nothing. There will be just strategies, there will be just documents and the capacities will not be uh, created. So it will be important to maybe share those messages with the member states. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Thank you very much. we we'll take one last before we now respond. Yes, please. Oh. Uh, good morning. My name is Abdul Hakim Ajijola. I'm a commissioner on the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace. I'm also one of the founders of the um, uh, Organization of Islamic Cooperation Computer Emergency Response Team. Uh, three of the issues I would be very interested in our heads of state, and I'm from Nigeria, uh, three of the issues I'd be very interested in our heads of state putting on the agenda and possibly agreeing to is, first of all, agreeing on an initial set of norms. Um, now, even if they, we can't get them because of the time to agree on some specific norms, at least let us get them to agree on the principle of the need for establishing uh, certain norms in cyberspace and specifically with regards to cybersecurity. The second issue I would want them to uh, address, if possible, is basically the issues of cross-jurisdictional efficiency, uh, how to improve it and what to do. And then basically the third issue I would want for them to uh, address is the issue of um, multi-state stand um, I mean multi standards. So that, um, for example, if somebody gets um, a capacity building certification in Nigeria, uh, that certification should be acceptable in the Caribbean or across the Commonwealth, basically. So maybe it's something that even the CTO uh, could drive, and one can discuss this later. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> we don't have to respond to all the questions. The objective is to get input. Uh, but just to take the five questions we've um, been asked, 
what is on training in Cameroon, and I can tell the guy from uh, Cameroon that we're doing a lot of work in Cameroon currently. ANTIC, which is the agency <coughs> uh, which the government has um, identified responsible for cybersecurity. We are currently training their staff on cybersecurity. So there's a lot of work going on there. Um, maybe I'll ask Robert to briefly talk about the harmonization um, and the norms which were have been proposed uh, by a friend from Nigeria. And mm -hmm. then there was also an issue on information exchange between private and government. Just very briefly. Uh, okay. Um, so the, the starting with the standards one, um, I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sorry. He, he can hear. Um, <laughs> it's for the online audience. Hey, oh, yes, sorry. Um, Internet age, got to remember that. Um, uh, I think the idea of the interoperability of standards is a really interesting one. Um, and something we've heard through other feedback is that the Commonwealth really likes um, model approaches and it also likes that idea of efficiency. Don't, re don't reinvent the wheel in different countries. If you can have interoperability, do so. Um, I think it's from my initial conversations with technical experts, who I might turn to Gavin on this one, I think um, it's, it's the sort of idea that we should be putting in now, but it would take quite a while to develop. Certainly we have a number of standards in the UK which we're already working with CTO to help other Commonwealth countries adopt. Um, if you're suggesting new Commonwealth standards, that will take even longer to use, uh, to develop and uh, get agreement to, but it's a good idea and one that we'll keep thinking about. Um, then there was the idea of norms. Um, I think certainly it would be wonderful if the heads of government were to uh, welcome the norms debate and encourage that to move forward. Whether the Commonwealth is the right forum for agreeing new norms and for moving that forward and whether we would have time for April, I think they're different questions, but I certainly want to see norms being something which was discussed, and I think heads of government would want to discuss it. Um, and then finally, on private sector, um, the information exchange, um, we didn't put it, I, I didn't encourage it to be a, like a 13th item, because to me, public-private partnership is something which should be enabler and run through every single project that is on that list. Um, in particular, incident response capabilities need to take into account the need for online information sharing platforms between certs and involving private companies. Public awareness campaigns work best where they work with private companies and the customers they have. And securing the banking and finance system, I think will absolutely need to involve industry at its heart. So um, it's something that, yeah, we were, we were really passionate about already. And the same with civil society, actually. I think that needs to run for all of these. Um, and the final thing I would say is I really hope that individual companies and civil society groups and countries will, st will st kind of step up and say, we are interested in really leading the conversation on particular ones of these, really contributing it to it and shaping where it goes. So um, that, that opportunity is still there. Thanks. Can I ask Gavin just to talk about the harmonization? You are running your center in the UK. How do you collaborate with other uh, countries? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. It's a very good one. Um, um, for in, in my agency, um, we are very keen on harmonization of standards. Um, a lot of our work is on the rather more technical product uh, focused uh, areas, and we're strong proponents of things like the, uh, the common criteria uh, recognition uh, arrangement. And we, we are very keen in any debates about international standards for products that the global uh, picture is taken into account and we, we are against um, small localized schemes wherever possible. Um, we have not been able to extend that as yet into the certification um, of uh, schemes in, in, in particular formal way. Uh, th there's been some progress in, in one or two things. Um, uh, the Crest pen testing scheme um, I believe is uh, international um, and that allows 
um, organizations from other countries to become certified as, as Crest licensed uh, pen testers. Uh, but, it, but it's certainly, it's a very valid point, but these things do not necessarily come quickly and easily, but I can certainly see the desirability of it, and it's, it's a thing that we, we, we have in mind. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't give you a, 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 a straightforward yes or no on that. We are, we are very keen on global certification for all kinds of things, and we would welcome any, any progress that was made in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. I saw one or two hands. Yes, quickly, please. Thank you. I think we've, we've touched on it, but I just want to emphasise it would be really good to see the heads of state establish a, 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 a strong coordination mechanism for all the cybersecurity activity. I'm sorry, I'm Duncan McIntosh from the Asia Pacific Network Information Centre, the internet registry for the region. So to give you one example, Fiji. At last count, the ITU, the Australian government, the New Zealand government, the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank are all funding cybersecurity initiatives and training that will land in Fiji in the next 12 months. And if the Commonwealth Office have a sixth initiative, that will come into Fiji without any engagement with the other five cybersecurity initiatives. And Tonga is probably the same, Samoa is probably the same. Um, that's what I can think of within the Commonwealth in our region. Um, and, and we certainly talk about coordination and engagement around it, but some sort of mechanism that would allow all those agencies to look at their different activities in particularly small island developing states would be really useful outcome. Well, Thanks. thank you very much. I can tell you that we are currently engaged with Australia uh, to see what we can help to do and your collaboration will be essential. If you can find some time to meet with us, that will be great. Robert, please. Um, yeah, I could not agree more. And that's why I'm uh, really excited about the global agenda and what the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise could be. Um, and so I think, uh, having been on the panels which are discussing this before, I think the, the key will be to have two groups of co community coordination. One is thematic, along the different uh, strands of activity, types of activity, and then the other is regional. So ideally, we'd get to the point where we are having meetings in the region where all the stakeholders were attending to do that deconfliction activity. And then if I can propose one step more, um, I try to learn from our development colleagues on this and what I see in other sectors, and there each country would normally have a health development strategy. And there would be a donor coordination meeting in the country hosted by the government around the government's own strategy, and they begin to say, you're working in the same space, or you're not working to our priorities, or this is what we see coming down the road. Um, and that's where I think probably we, will, we would like to get to as a community with ownership by the, uh, the local government and everyone comes and delivers to their plan. But I know that's going to be a while, so let's do the regional coordination first. Great. I'm also happy to inform you that um, early this year I had a breakfast meeting with the Pacific ministers and they've mandated me to gather them together, possibly in the Pacific, to discuss cyber security. We want to place it on the high agenda for them. Uh, so it's quite in line with what you said. Any last minute questions or inputs? Online. Online, okay. Please go. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have a question from Bernice from uh, Kenya. What is the Commonwealth doing about encouraging the adoption of multi stakeholder model in government institutions to fight cyber attacks, since government institutions are the ma majorly vulnerable to cyber issues? Um, thank you, Bernice. I know her quite well. Um, I said in my opening remarks that one of the challenges we've faced is to convince certain governments to involve multi-stakeholders in the whole concept. And I said it's encouraging. We're now getting governments who are now recognizing that without that multi-stakeholder approach, they will not achieve what they themselves intended to achieve from the very beginning. We are prepared to talk to any minister foreign minister at any level just to, you know, um, massage them, if you like, to get them convinced. Um, I remember a case in Nigeria where the National Security Agency didn't want to talk to anyone. And when we got there, we said, no, we need to talk together, you know. And that process really has helped um, to get everyone wanting to talk to every other person 
whether you are the security agencies, the operators, the ISPs, um, I think it's happening. So um, we are sure that we are working that area. Yes, please, please. So I, I also wanted to address the, the comment that the OAS made as well, because I think it's important to understand that in small and developing states and these developed countries where many of the issues that are being uh, raised in the Commonwealth that need to be raised, mm -hmm. the resources are in fact a challenge. And one of the things that, um, one of the projects that we worked on before in the Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative, one of the things we learned is that treating cybercrime and cybersecurity as a separate issue on its own creates problems. Governments do not treat with it in the same way as crime and security. So one of the things that, one of the learnings that came out was that perhaps there's a way to bring cybercrime and cybersecurity into the security and crime discussions full stop because that's where resources are going anyhow in regional discussions and in discussions on border control, terrorism, and those other issues. So while they may seem to be sexy to keep it separate, it's important to ensure that where the resources are coming, they are mainstreamed into the other discussions on crime and security. And the point that's being raised about people coming in from all directions of cybersecurity is because it's sexy, cyber is sexy, but you create a whole disconnect and, dis and dis disorder with things happening all over the place, and then it never gets the attention it deserves. And that is never good for anyone, including government. Now, having worked in government, I can tell you that. So it's important, I think, for everybody to understand that if we want to invest in cybersecurity and cybercrime, make sure it's mainstreamed into the overall security and crime discussions and where the resources lie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I haven't had any question from, yeah, Madam, yes, please. Um, maybe not so much as a question as a comment. Uh, so it's Alex from Privacy International, actually, uh, maybe from the, the last speaker's point, actually for us it is very problematic for cybercrime and cybersecurity to be brought together um, because from uh, a legal perspective and a human rights perspective, it generates and triggers different uh, actors involved, different legal mechanisms and different um, uh, redress mechanisms as well. So what we're seeing actually is that states are combining the two as a way to be able to uh, say, to expand and to kind of fuel how big the problem is um, and to allow for further expensive um, technologies being used, but also legal mechanisms to address the two. So from our perspective, actually, it's quite important to separate the two. So um, yeah, just wanted to bring that to, to the table, but we can discuss it afterwards. <laughs> well, that's a very interesting concept. Do we separate, do we combine? As long as they're being addressed, Fine, <laughs> that's the bottom line. Any other inputs? Um, at this stage, let me just ask for some very short closing remarks from uh, presenters. Uh, is there anything that you want to add? Yes, Robert, please. Um, it's dangerous to put a microphone in front of me. Yes, <laughs> 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 that, um, this, I always feel a bit awkward in these things, that there's panelists and then there's audience listening because this really has been a community effort. The thing which makes the Commonwealth great is its people and uh, the internet was built by people. It is a people-based thing and if this is going to work it will only be done by forming those communities of people around the Commonwealth who have a passion for these issues um, and brings them together and uh, uses governments uh, resources to support them through this process. So I'm, I'm going to talk to a number of you afterwards to essentially say thank you for your questions and how can we work with you um, to build solutions which are going to work for the Commonwealth. So my apologies in advance for um, trying to collar you in the corridor, but we really are serious about this. It needs to be something which is built by the people of the Commonwealth and involves companies, civil societies, and universities as much as we can achieve. Great, so we need more engagement, that's the, that's the message. Gavin, please. Uh, very briefly, please do the obvious things to secure your systems. Many of the bad things that we talk about at conferences like this will then go away. Thank you. Don't forget to go and check the password guidelines. That's very key, it's interesting, it's exciting. Tracy, you have the last word. And thank you, so um, again, just wants to, to ensure that the, the issues that, that face developing and, and the least developed countries are somewhat different to the issues that face developed countries. So let's not necessarily conflate the issues. Let us show we understand clearly 
what the issues really are in the countries. And if there's going to be an agenda that's being put forward, let's give some real attention to what the countries in the least developed and SIDS are saying, as opposed to bringing prescriptive solutions that will simply um, not solve the problem. So I want to make sure that's, in, that's important for the Commonwealth and its governments and to listen carefully to what's being said. And we don't have five or six or seven or ten solutions coming for one single problem. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Oh. Yeah, don't worry about that. Don't look at it. Uh, <laughs> again, the, the main reason why we call this meeting is to get your input. We will continue the process. Don't look at it. <laughs> look at me. <laughs> Um, we want to have your input, your dreams, as you said, uh, in terms of what we want the, the heads of government to do. We are going to be sharing this with our member states, with stakeholders, private, government, and please feel free to engage with us in the corridors, online. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Thank you. Good.